Good afternoon, Mr. Putnam. <laughs> How are you doing today, sir? Pretty well. Now, I, I know you're a little bit hard of hearing, and you can, you can look over to me, and I'll, I'll get close to your ear. But um, we're going we're gonna to interview you today, and we're just going to work through the fact that um, as we get older, our hearing gets, gets worse, doesn't it? But uh, we can't help it. With, with some help from the Navy, yes. <laughs> so uh, that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, first of all, where are you from? Well, originally I was born in Dakotas. Dakotas, okay. And, uh, raised, raised in South Dakota. What brought you to Texas? What brought you to Texas? Uh, southeastern part of South Dakota. Around Sioux Falls, I guess, somewhere, something like that. What, what branch of service did oh, you... I was in the Navy. I uh, was in a short time. I enlisted late in the war for the duration. And when it was over, they sent me home. So I have about two years, a little more than two years service. However, we went through boots at Great Lakes and they picked the 10 of us to go on to school and that kind of stuff. And they sent me to a radar school in Fort Lauderdale Beach Hotel. Radar was brand new then. They, they, just, they just discovered it about five or six months, I guess, ago. They didn't know much about it, and I do. I did. I did. I did, and 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 I didn't know a whole lot. Anyway, I went on to destroy the DD-638, the Herndon, and went out to sea. That was about four months after I enlisted, I'd say. And we we went out on patrol a couple times in the in the uh, Atlantic, and uh, it was quite exciting to me. Uh, I'd never seen the ocean before. I don't know why I listed in, but I went to the Navy, that's what I wanted. <laughs> we, uh, our skipper was a very nice man, I thought. The kids, all, folks all liked him, the true all liked him, and we went out we had a couple warnings out there. Submarines were out there and had to patrol and try to see if we could find one and depth bomb or something like that. We never did. I don't know if we scared them off or anything. I really don't know. We, uh, we were chosen as a far part of the of the escort for Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he went to the Yalta Conference. This is when the war was over. Not Japan, but the European war. When he went to Yalta Conference in the Mediterranean, Churchill and Stalin and all of them went. And we were chosen as part of the escort. And we went to, to Bermuda and, and, and uh, just kind of took a little few days there in Bermuda, laid around, went swimming, whatever, and then we met him in mid-ocean, and he had a brand new cruiser of some, I can't remember the name of it, very fast, and could go much faster than we could do. So we met him in mid-ocean and escorted him into the Mediterranean. And then we, we stopped off in Naples Harbor. That's where we were, and then some other people took him on in. Naples Harbor was all bombed out. There was just a path through Naples, the whole city. Just a, just a, just a one place where the army go. Everything else was down and crumbles. There was not a decent building in the whole city of Naples. The harbor was up, down, ships. You could see the bottom of the ships more than you could see the top. We had to go through them to get to the landing. There was nothing on the beach. There was no electricity or water or bathrooms or anything. So you didn't make liberty. Or you better not make liberty, let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a light, it, it got dark, it got dark. <laughs> wasn't no light or anything. So uh, that was different. Our skipper was a not good man, he organized, I can't remember his name, no, blame it. 
Anyway, organized a, got a truck somewhere and took us to a tour of the city of, of Vesuvius, it's quite close, and took us a, a tour of, of Vesuvius. Uh, had a guide and everything. And they, they showed us some things that, uh, because we were all men, and things that were, they don't show the, uh, the, 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 most of the people when there's a mixed crowd. When we got back, it was getting dark with, from that tour. And we didn't have any way of getting aboard ship and the storm was coming up. Them storms in the, in the come up very quick in the Mediterranean, they're, and they're short, choppy waves. And our, our skipper, uh, by telephone, didn't know what to do. There was no place for us on the beach to, unless we laid on the ground. And you didn't know how many spies there were or something, so you didn't want to lay on the ground much either. Anyway, A British crew was on there, and they're kind of proud of their seamanship. And they had what they call a frigate, I think. It's an enclosed, a metal thing, an enclosed. It's maybe about 40 foot long. He said, well, we can get you aboard. Well, we were kind of desperate, so okay. I think there was six of us, or no there was more than that. It must have been 10 of us. We had ship, three ships in the convoy three destroyers. The problem with a destroyer, it's pretty big. And this frigate would go up and down pretty fast every time the waves would go. Trouble was getting aboard. You couldn't climb that ladder that fast, that rope ladder. So they got two feet, two at the, uh, my guy at the foot, and the guy at the foot. And when the frigate was up and the storm was done, they, they got you aboard. <laughs> he threw you over. <laughs> We've all made it. <laughs> Not in a very scientific way. No. Anyway, on the way back from that, we had a terrific hurricane. And we were caught out in the middle of the Atlantic with a hurricane. It was hard to believe. I believe on that destroyer there was 100% seasick. I believe it. Boy, that thing was going around. I mean, it's something else. Proofing on the instruments on all FIPS. They, get, they take recordings of all the instruments. We had a 54 degree roll. Wow. And you're not supposed to come back no. from them. No, you're not. That's okay. We'll edit that out. That's all right. We'll, we'll go ahead. Right. Anyway, so I start, was. Start again from that 54 degree roll. Well. I, I was in the roll. hammock. I was aboard in the hammock. Rolled didn't mean a damn thing to me. I was on the level. <laughs> so all through this, you were yeah. you were just swinging. So I didn't know much like was going pendulum. on. Yeah. But I, you know, after it took two or three days, we had. I was I was awful sick, and there, all the rest of them were. I pulled myself up the ladder, where the more my. Uh, where my station was, you know, I'm, I'm, I was in CIC and radar, so you could talk right directly to the skipper. And we made it in, but when I got in there, they had the whole crew up and go to the doctor and called him. And he said, I should not ever go to sea again. Beg pardon, ladies, but if you can't get rid of your body waste, you're in trouble. And you couldn't keep water down, any liquid down. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And it, it would, well, you'd die if you couldn't get rid of them. Yeah. And I couldn't, evidently, because you get so thick, you can't keep water or anything down. Yeah. So I got transferred to a, a camera party on the old two, number one, World War I ship, Wyoming. We were on the Chesapeake Raider, they called us. But it was a training ship for all the crews that had come aboard and the newer ships. They had all the old-fashioned guns and mm -hmm. the new equipment on the thing. 
and they would fire them, and they had a they had a target way off there in the in the distance, and we had a tripod like that, but a big one. Yeah. Like the Bell and Howell. Yeah. Move the camera, thing over our arm. We could go this way and up and down and any way we wanted to. We had 450 feet of film in that can, and we were stationed at a certain place. On, I was on the back of forecastle. I, I need to ask you a question right here. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question. I kid, tell my kids when I'm done filming, I say I put it in the can, and they said, where did that come from? And I said, when film just came out, it was very flammable, so you put it in a can. How is that why that, that, that was dangerous to have that film? Because it was really flammable back then. Well, they didn't have a whole lot of cameras. So let me, let me. Anyway. I was there with a tripod, and they know the triangle, the base of that ship exactly. Yes. And using trigonometry, we'd follow that ship, that bullet out, believe it or not, with that camera. You could follow it out and see where it would splash. Really? So he was over, front or under, or left or right. We partly repaired it, and we photographed it. So they could correct up or down or whatever. That's that's how they they practice it, and that those guns were going off, all of them, at one time or another, 16, 12, 8, 6, whatever, and there was an awful lot of concussion. That's where you partially lost your hearing, probably. That whole ship would jump when they shoot. Wow. And of course we had we had things in our ears. We had a uh, foul weather gear over our face. We had earphones over over ourselves, but still. And we, we didn't think much of it. It just didn't start. I didn't start losing my hearing until probably 70 years old. Yeah. So you followed, that's the way they, they saw, the, saw the accuracy of their rounds in the target practice, was you actually filmed it. Well, you took and took that film back to the old ship, Wyoming. That's where we were quartered. Down in the in the and we had our film laboratory, and we developed it and put it in guard mail and sent it to the captain or the wherever. Yeah. Uh, Admiral, rather. So uh, I don't know what happened to him then. But one thing about it, if Putnam was on the job and Putnam took the film, Putnam developed, there's nobody could blame but Putnam. That's true. You, you were the guy that they'd have to come yeah. back to. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about that hurricane again? Did you lose any ships in that hurricane or did you all make it back? We all made it back. You know, they, they had that hurricane in the Pacific and they lost a lot of ships. No, the whole ship came back and everybody aboard. Everybody nobody aboard washed came back. off. We all made it back. Uh, How old were you when, when you were serving? I was older. I think about 27 or 26. Wow. I was deferred going into the service in the first place, I had passed a four-year training course in engineering at Caterpillar Tractor Company in Peoria, Illinois. Married at home and all that. And when the war, when we got into it, Caterpillar was hot. They wanted tanks. They wanted this. They wanted that. Right now. And Caterpillar said, well, we can't do that unless you if you're going to take all our men so they went through the plant and, and planned the ones that were deferred and I was one of them because I had gone through a four-year training and, and I had a good job out there was I'd be more good to the war effort there than I would be on a ship that yeah, was the that, idea that's true and, and a lot of people don't realize that if you don't get the tanks and the machines to the war it, it doesn't that's, go that's when all the ladies got into it. Yeah, they, and they Boy, brought Boy, we had ladies them. all of a sudden in that engineering department, found her anywhere. They had ladies, crane operator, crane operator, everything was, because the men gone off, see? Well, the women could do it. They did a good job, too. Didn't yes, they? they did. Yes, they did. It's a good thing, really. Yes. Anyway, they were supposed to give me more money, and they kept saying, well, next mech, next mech. I, I'm kind of short-tempered, I guess. I said, look, 
This is the last time I'm going to take that. Well, they figured they had me. They go, he deferred. He didn't want to go in. On one day, they said, I didn't get it. I went down to the post office and enlisted. So I was late in the war. But you made it. Yes, I got in there. About two years. But that's why I was deferred. You know, we I have... couldn't go in. I couldn't. If I'd have gone and enlisted then, they would have canceled it. I wouldn't have been able to do that. You know, but it, it, they had different technology back then. And, and today, when we're fighting or, or you're on the ship at night, you know, you can see just like the day. But I mean, at nighttime, when you're trying to search and, and look for the submarines, how, how, did, how did you do that at night? How did with night, the well, radar? On the, yeah, on the boat. Doesn't make did any difference. Work? With night or day, with really? radar, that beam going out night or day. In sonar, you had yes. sonar too. You could, we had it good enough that we could navigate. Really? We can navigate the shoreline or a hazard or something out there, like a boy. We could pick that up. I don't remember it was ever good enough on our ship, anyway, to get up a periscope. A periscope is pretty hard to see. Yeah, was that scary? Wave going up and down. I mean, that was, had to be scary. They though. don't they don't stick them way up there, no, you know. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't. They, they really don't. So, I don't know that we ever saw a periscope. Yeah, I'd have been scared. I didn't like that. I went in the Army. I. That Navy being on a ship, it just wasn't for me. And and uh, that's pretty much the story. And and then when it was a, uh, I have one thing that right there from New York City, uh, Pier 92. That's where we are, and the shipyard there was where we were headquartered out of. There was a place in New Jersey, just across the bay. They call it Leandro. I don't know if it's there yet or not, but it's all swamp and low ground, ground in there. But our country went in there and put some big concrete piers down in that swamp and put a road on top of it, cement road, two train car cars, two train car tracks on top of it. So it was a big job and it went out so that they had dredged in, so the, a big ship could come in there and and get de or get fuel and, and get all their, their ammunition, everything off of them. And it, when, the, when the pier got out there, it forced out. And inside, here's where the ship was all, all the ships. Yeah. There was always some of them in there. We were in there, we came back from Liberty we got in about 10 o'clock, went in at Pier 92. Hey, your ship is it's gone. Uh oh, what do I do now? And the guy came over, oh, here, here, here. It was, they took us in a guard mail, clear around through the tunnel and over to the this Leandro place. And we put it in the, got our ship. And they had just taken ammunition aboard. The, the shells were sitting on deck. And, places between them for kids to, to operate the ship. Over on this other fork, there was an oil tanker filling up another ship, probably going to get us after a while. And that was their job. Something happens. And you know, there's always a, there's always a son of a bitch in every crew. Somebody must have lit a cigarette or something, and that oil tanker caught a fire. No way. That's not good. And it was 200 yards, I'd say, between these things, I'd say. Enough to turn the ship around pretty good. <clears throat> it caught on fire. Of course, they didn't want all their their ships on the lung with their, their get tough, so they cut, the, chopped, uh, cut them loose from their... Uh, Morning, the housing morning. where they were tied up, yeah. but the tide they hadn't figured that the tide was going out, so that burning ship was coming, going out to sea, but it was coming right at us, and we were tied up on the pier. <laughs> there was a lot of business going on at that. If you change temperature rapidly. I think 40 degrees, 50 degrees, on a shell like that, it'll explode. 
Well, that'd have been a great big fireworks for the for the New York City right there. Yeah, that'd have been a train cars loaded with ammunition and two three ships was, oh boy, that was. <laughs> anyway, they got a, a metal tug. A metal tug, all metal, and poked it through that that flame of the water on that tanker, all all on fire, and put the nose in there and pushed it. So it went past us out the out toward the sea, and then it finally burned out and sunk out there. Wow. But I tell you, there was a lot of us saying, well, this is it. You know, that, that's a question, the last question, last question I want to ask you. Um, you know, you saw both sides of the war, the war effort, you know, with, with getting everything ready, getting all the supplies, building things, and then you went actually, you went in. And today you just got back from church. Um, how, does your, how did your faith, you know, your belief in God, play into you getting through. I mean, you're 104 years old, sir. And, um, and, and I, I imagine you have a lot of wisdom as far as, as you know, your relationship with God. I did some praying. I didn't want to embarrass my teammates. Some of them were and some of them were not. Some of them could care less. On my own self, I, I probably said a, a few words every day, no question about it, when I had in between shifts or something. But I did it privately. I didn't, I didn't say, come on, fellas, or something. And I'm kind of ashamed of that, but that's, I'm a Lutheran. I was born and raised that way, and I still am, and my family's all Lutheran people. I, I, I still, well, I went to church today. I go to church every day that I get a chauffeur to take me there. Yeah, you got a, you got a wonderful daughter sitting off the yeah, side. Yeah, I got, I got two of them this morning. Yeah, two of them. By the way, that's our housekeeper. That's been there yeah. about 25 years for wow. there. Wow. So I guess, I guess it's important, you know, as you get older, you think about, you know, sharing your faith and, and how important that is. But yes. I, you got to be thankful that God got you through it. I can be thankful that I didn't get messed up in the war. That's a good, that's one place. I had a wonderful wife and family. My wife put up with me for 77 years. Wow. Yeah, my, my wife has put up with me we, for a long time too, but not 77 <laughs> years. And we raised four children, all good kids. Yep. I've met them. No, well, not, a couple of them I have. None of them, none of them are in, in, uh, on dope, and, and none of them in jail, and and uh, they're all paying their bills. Some will have a little trouble, but that's all right. They're all different, every one of them. But just think, a woman saved with a guy for 77 years. You know, she had to be something wrong with her. <laughs> she had a lot of grace. <laughs> Well, I'm thankful you're you made it to the interview, and I'm I, I'm thankful that you know God has given you a chance to you know to do this interview because a lot of people are going to see this and hear your story, and, and that's important. Oh, well, I could talk all day, but but somebody asked me, this is an old old story. Somebody asked me one time. What's the secret to having married that long? I said, well, I don't think there's any secret. You got to have a couple of things. I said, first, you got to have a good woman. If you don't have a good woman, well, forget about all the other stuff, because that, that's, that's the whole thing. But there's something else you ought to know, too. You better learn how to say yes, dear, about 10 different ways. <laughs>
a hell of a time. And the depression, if you, you get your, you get your, 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 your years all straightened out, that was a, a pretty bad time. It was not a big, big depression time. So we had a pretty tough time. And my, my mother's family helped us tremendously. They took us in and helped us and you do this. That. Anyway, when I got out, I had that, out of high school, I had a couple scholarships. One was to this Caterpillar training course, and one was a school of, the Juilliard School in New York City. I had won the state championship for singing baritone and a baritone horn in Dakota. So I, I was, I thought I'd done pretty well. Anyway, but I had to make a living in Chicago and go to school. I couldn't think I could do that. So I took the Dakota one. I mean, the, the, in pure Illinois, and that's where I got to Illinois. That's where I met my wife. I went to a, you know, a kid 18 years old, he can just sit still too long. They didn't pay me very much at that place. I don't think I can tell you what they paid me. But I, got, I had a quarter after a while and I went to a seat dance in Peoria, Illinois. 25 cents is what they call, it was a roof above a commercial building downtown that had a high parapet around the wall and a nice dance floor, but it cost you 25 cents. You went up that big ladder, up the big steps, policemen standing up there. On this corner was a soda, soda and sandwich and that kind of stuff, catty corner. Over in this other catty corner was a four or five piece band. <laughs> By the way, they had one microphone in the band and there was no guitars or anything like that at all. Everything had to be percussion, otherwise you couldn't hear it. Yeah. And for some reason, women at that time, they would come, if they came by themselves or with a couple of them, they walk around that dance floor and then walk clear around and come over here and stand around and watch the boys and the men stand over on this side. Believe it or not, that's the way it worked. I saw a blonde, looked pretty good, and I walked my way around, went on. Went over and asked, asked like, would you dance with me? She says, no. She says, but come back later. I think hard to get, playing hard to get, I think. Something. Anyway, I came back and I danced. That lady stayed with me 77 years. Wow. I used to tease her. I said, look what I got for a quarter. <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it to Texas. It's warmer down here and, and I got to interview you. All the time that we were, the vacation, we came south. Yeah. We were tired of that snow and ice and everything. Yeah. Just, we came. The first job I had, I bought a half interest in a construction company in McAllen. Yeah. And then that big freeze in 59 froze up with us, so I had to come back up to Corpus Christi and start over. Well, well you're a Texan now. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Where two of us were. I got a little store there if you got time. Sure. Is your the you food went, is ready? Oh, their food's ready. Um, we're gonna we're gonna let you go eat, and we'll I'll listen to that story over there. Okay. Well, let me get this story off of okay. mine while they got it. Huh? Okay. All right. Everything was froze up in the valley. Okay. Nothing. My partner took bankruptcy overnight and left me with the to take care of it. And he took off somewhere. Good man. Good for nothing. Anyway. I had there and I had one child, a little boy, that's all I had at that time. So I got in my truck and my pickup, my, my, my steak truck I had, and went to Corpus Christi on Highway 44, that's where all the traffic was in those days. The first lumber yard I stopped up was Morrison Lumber, lumber Company. I talked to the boss. I said, I gotta have something to do. Uh, so what? I said, look, I've built houses, I've drawn them up, I've sold them, I've lived in them, and I'm a good, I'm, I'm real good at it. He started him and all the rest. He had a whole subdivision going out there, and he says, but I don't have a, you got a plan? I says, no. Oh, he says, I got to have a plan. 
I had him ask this. Mrs. Gray up there at the balcony has got a board up there. Got a drop drafting board up there. If you let me use that tonight, overnight, I'll have a plan for you in the morning. He looked at me like I was crazy. He said, really? I said, yeah. And I went up there and stayed all night at 4 o'clock in the morning and went out and get my truck. And I was dumb. I had a complete set of plans, four elevations, ready to go down. The, and he looked at that. He put $10,000 in a joint account. And we let, let my start in Corpus Christi. And we went out and built a house for him. That's a great story. That's a great story. Well, you got grit, sir. <laughs> and it has been an honor. So... Yes, sir. All right. Sir, I want to thank you for being on Honor Cafe Hall of Heroes. Uh, you're a hero. And um, oh. I'm just, uh, it was just great to hear your story. Thanks again for tuning in.